Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you today um, to talk about the, the future of cities and what this looks like after um, the pandemic. You know, even as vaccines are sort of rolling out and we can sort of see a light at the end of the tunnel, um, it's clear that the pandemic has um, had a significant impact on the way Texans will sort of live, work, and even play in our communities um, in the future. You know, many of us are still working remotely. We're still doing events virtually. Um, we're still gathering with friends digitally, perhaps for, for Zoom happy hours. And a considerable number of our students are, are still uh, learning remotely. And, and all the while, as we've, we've sort of have grappled with the pandemic in the last year, um, we've seen calls for social and equi um, economic justice, um, the continuization of extreme weather events like hurricanes and the recent Texas freeze, a new Biden administration and a Texas legislature meeting all the while as Texas grows more urban. I don't know about you, but that seems like a very exhausting year of big events that have happened and they're changing the landscape of, of the way that we are living and working in Texas. I am excited to be with you all today when, and with our terrific panel to talk about the trends that we are seeing and how these are accelerating um, in, our, in our cities. And some of the questions that we'll address, I think, is you know, in the future, how will our cities be different? How will our communities across Texas adapt to these changes? What will be the nature of our built environment? Are there downsides to these changes? Some good, some bad. Let's, let's unpack that and understand the implications. And then I think a question that many of us really care about in our communities um, is how do we ensure that we're thinking about resiliency in the future and a more equitable and just opportunity for all Texans? To help us unpack these, conversa these questions and conversations, we're joined by four outstanding guests today. Um, who I'm really excited to, um, to speak with and, and engage in a conversation with. First, we've got Matt Curtis. Uh, Matt is um, a former right-hand uh, hand, um, uh, of two past mayors here in Austin, has decades of experience working on municipal uh, initiatives, um, and really understands sort of the best practices that are helping cities adapt to, to the changing environment. In 2017, uh, Matt formed uh, the Smart City Policy Group really at this helping cities uncover the intersection between uh, local government and changes um, that we're seeing in the innovation economy. Matt, it's good to have you and thanks for joining us today. Um, we're also joined by uh, Michelle Dippel. Michelle is the Senior Vice President um, and South Central Texas Office Leaders of NHNTB, a transportation infrastructure firm um, that offers solutions around transit and mobility. Um, she's also, as uh, many of you know, a strong advocate for regional mobility issues. She serves on the board of directors for the Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce um, and is a part of the Regional Mobility Committee. Mich uh, Michelle, it's, it's great to see you and great for joining us as well. We are also very lucky to have with us um, um, Sharmila uh, Mukherjee, and I just butchered her last name even after practicing it several times. <laughs> Uh, Marcella is an executive EVP of, uh, of planning and development at um, Capital Metro. More than 20 years of decade of experience doing urban transportation planning um, and experience in the Bay Area um, as Detroit and Chicago. Um, um, Sharmila, it's great to have you and, and, and look forward to your insights on transportation as that's going to be a critical issue going forward. And then finally, um, we are very lucky to have joining with us today um, Commissioner Rodney Ellis, um, Commissioner Ellis is, uh, has served the Houston community um, three times on city council, 26 years as a state senator, and now in his second term as county commissioner uh, for, this, uh, for Harris County. Commissioner, it's great to have you. Um, we're also excited to have you because you are an LBJ graduate um, as well. So it's good to, good to have our panelists um, joining us for today's conversation. Um, as a reminder, you all, we are going to take questions, as Eric had mentioned, you can put those in the Q&A function and we'll look through those as throughout the, um, the panel moves forward and, and then also address, the, and address those at the end. And if you've got questions, you can also follow along on social media using the hashtag um, LBJ uh, Future Forum. So with that long introduction, Matt, let's start with you. Um, as we look across Texas and trying to understand and survey the landscape, right? What the impacts that we've seen with COVID, with the calls for racial um, justice and equity, and, and even thinking about the impact that, that we've seen um, with natural disasters here in Texas. 
what's been the good? And then what are some of the challenges that we've seen? And, and I like to start with the good. What are some of the things that we're seeing that are positives over the last course of the year that we may be seeing in our communities across the state? No, it's incredible, right? I mean, I mean, cities are in a great place. Cities are doing very well. We're seeing cities grow and reach for new innovations. Uh, and they're doing it at, at, at a rapid pace. Uh, it's kind of shocking because, you know, a lot of people might hunker down during a, a pandemic like we just did. But uh, we're seeing cities make real investments in mobility innovations. We just did something here in Austin with Prop A, with uh, investing in an in incredibly needed and expansive uh, mobility uh, infrastructure uh, network here. But in other cities as well, large and small, they're building, they're doing more. They're making things happen. So I don't think Texas cities did this lying down at all. We saw great leadership from our big cities, but also small cities uh, uh, reach out for those needed changes that uh, they could take advantage of during this time. On the challenges front, you know, we certainly have one major challenge that's going to impact us, whether it's through transportation issues, um, our health care systems and other things, and that's wellness. Uh, we certainly saw a lot of statistics here recently about people who gained weight uh, might be, you know, drinking a lot of wine and eating a lot of ice cream uh, during COVID. But for what, whatever reason, uh, uh, many people gained weight during this time. Cities have a challenge with that going forward. You know, we need to make sure that we have a very healthy community. We need to focus on well-being and wellness. It means better access and better use of our transportation systems and our transit systems. Uh, but it also just means a, a better, more robust uh, economic base from our own talent pool in these cities. Yeah. Yeah, I know I've drank probably my fair share of red wine this year, um, like many of you. So um, absolutely. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned health and wellness. I think for many of us that have been in that economic development space, particularly, um, you know, my work, I, I had never um, really married public health and economic development initiatives together as much as I've done this year and in, in thinking in my thinking um, as well. So I think that's a, a really important issue that will that will become uh, a, a really more at the forefront of the way that we're sort of thinking about these issues. You know, Texas is a pretty diverse state. We've got urban rural divides, right? Um, I'm curious to get your thoughts. We, you know, obviously larger cities have, um, have done a lot of advancements, even some of our smaller communities. What's your take on the pandemic's impact on some of the more rural communities here in Texas, perhaps? I mean, there's no denying. I mean, it's been a hit for everyone. Uh, it really has. But, um, you know, I think we certainly have seen um, probably a significant change in, uh, in our economy. We all, you know, I'm not saying anything we don't all know. We've seen a lot of small businesses and a lot of restaurants take a real hit as well as other outlets. Uh, but we've also seen a lot of innovation uh, and people are trying to figure out how to get out of this well. Uh, and from the county perspective, when you look at rural Texas counties, uh, I think they've done that very well. And there's different organizations that you can look at that to uh, give credit to. But one thing I think over, or, uh, overwhelmingly, when you look at different Texas counties uh, and, and rural Texas towns, it's really just that innovative spirit and that drive for us to come out of this well. And, and we've seen that work. So while it certainly has been a hit, people have not let them let it be a hit that's kept them down. Mm -hmm. So Commissioner Ellis, you're on the ground in Houston. You're dealing with these issues every day um, on the forefront. How is this playing out in Harris County? Well, we um, obviously have had tremendous uh, challenges, you know, from uh, a rain event to the traditional hurricane events that we have. It's always good to point out that Harvey was a rain event. Hurricane did not hit us here. It was a devastating event. And who would have thought we'd end up with ice storm? Uh, so tremendous challenges, tremendous growth. Uh, I, I think that uh, our new leadership uh, here in the city and in the county, even before the George Floyd tragedy, there has been a renewed and quantitative focus on equity and in ways that you can measure it. So after Harvey, uh, we did pass a $2.5 billion bond package, but we did put equity language in the order to do the bond package. Uh, and we have adopted principles. So we will consider a number of factors, including social vulnerability. So we don't continue to let those same areas that have flooded historically continue to flood. And our challenges with following through on it, in part because there are so many systems put in place that reward property value over people. 
Yeah. So we end up tracing with our local money, federal money to a great extent, and federal money that went to the state where they have no equity guidelines because it's hard for us to pay for it all on our level. Healthcare is a big, a, a tremendous challenge, particularly for us uh, here in the Houston region where we have the, uh, the greatest medical center in the world. Now, you know, we text and say that about everything. And this one, we really do have the largest. I won't say the greatest, but the largest yeah. at Texas Medical Center. And that's great for people who live in the neighborhood that I live in now. But it's not so great for people who live in the neighborhood I came out of mm-hmm. when I decided to go to the LBJ school. There's a tremendous inequality. And that gap, the inequity index is growing tremendously. Mm-hmm. It was growing during the best of times, and it's growing even more so during the worst of times. Mm -hmm. Good news on the horizon. I'm very pleased that President Biden passed a uh, record relief package, in my judgment, uh, something on par with what FDR did. Uh, And obviously, there was tremendous inequity in that, because if you look like me, it only applied to you. The GI Bill to go to college, you get a home. If you could go to a black school that would take you, or if you could go to a black neighborhood that legally you could move into. If you were Hispanic, the same way, or you had to fake it. Uh, but, and now Biden's, or, or, or what he did with that relief package is in many ways on par with LBJ's war on poverty. Mm-hmm. That obviously in some ways was uh, sidetracked with uh, the expense of, of, of a war. Uh, and now we're going to have a very substantive infrastructure program. I was on a call with the Millican, a Zoom with the Millican Institute this morning. You still got that same issue of equity. Mm-hmm. We got to find a way that equity is more than a six letter word. Yeah. And that's what it is with most people, that they really treat like a four letter word. If you catch my drift, <laughs> you got me. Uh, so everybody's for it. It's like everybody quotes King speeches, but they wouldn't have been around if they were alive. Yeah, when it was time to be on the right side of history. Yeah, I mean, I think I think to your point, I mean, one of the things that everyone's talking about equity. I mean, almost every call that I'm on with cities and counties across the country, Texas to Portland, Oregon, where I was on this morning to New York, everyone's talking about equity. But the real question, I think, is where the rubber meets the road. How does it get beat, uh, built into our economic development agendas? How does it get built into our transportation agendas, our land use and those are things that I want to explore a little bit deeper. And, and, and that, that is um, a great segment to, our, to the conversation. And I want to start by going back to starting with land use, transportation, and then going back to this larger economic development agenda. Um, Michelle, obviously, we know that the pandemic has brought impact uh, from rem- remote work, right? Um, 30% of us are doing it now. Um, 30% of us will probably do it. Um, have an opportunity to do it after, as as has been mentioned before, for many of us, we know that it is a, uh, a, a luxury, perhaps, and we have to think about how to do that in a much more equitable way. Um, but what are the ramifications that we see from remote work as it reflects maybe on our built environment going forward? Because there's a lot of death to cities right now out there in terms of the narratives. Your thoughts or perspectives on that? I'd say I, I think my opinion is is probably a little bit different than what you're hearing. Um, we are we have we have traditionally been an in office environment, right? We're engineers and planners, and we we like to roll out the roll plots and you know hunker down over the plans and and work together in sort of a collaborative atmosphere. And that piece of it has changed dramatically. Um, we were working together one day, and 24 hours later, we thought we went home for two weeks. And we had a we had a band aid for technology, and then we got better and better and better as the year went on, at um, at making use of the technology. And so our our productivity wasn't impacted, but I feel like maybe our innovation has suffered a little bit because mm-hmm. we don't have access to people in the same way. And so while I have twenty five, I'm here in the office as you can see, and I have about twenty five percent of my staff are here in the office. And I have about 75% of my staff who have said they're ready to come back, at least in some form or fashion. They miss their people and they're tired of the Brady Bunch screens and they're ready to roll out the roll plots and do the, do the pencil thing that our engineers like to do. So while others are looking at uh, shrinking their footprint, I'm looking at expanding. The commercial market is 
is great right now, right? Everybody's going home and thinking I'm going to shrink. And my thought is it's a great time to expand. We need to have more space. We need more space for our people so we can be a little bit more distant while we're at work. And we need bigger conference rooms so we can accommodate the need for a little bit more space. I don't know how, if that's a long-term or short-term, but um, right now that's what we're looking at. And, uh, you know, really with the intent of improving innovation and conversation Mm -hmm. by keeping us close, will we be more flexible? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, We've learned that we can be, we can afford to be a little bit more flexible and we will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think from the workplace, the flexibility on the edges are something that's important. But one of the things I think we know is that innovation and ideas still happen with the idea of people and enterprises coming together. I I, I do want to talk about local innovation. Um, So if we do see a surplus of commercial space in markets, just if we're, if we're thinking about this, prices are a little bit lower. um, How does this maybe start to help us address some in, in, in some innovative ways, our land use policy, maybe the way we're thinking about affordable housing, any sort of big ideas that you would say, these are issues I really care about. And I got this really out of the box idea that we should be considering around these issues. Any thoughts on that? I'd say, you know, for the last year, I think everybody's been saying, we're going to all be in our only back in single person vehicles again, and we're never going to ride transit and nobody wants to be close to each other ever again. And then, um, you know, the lights come up just a little bit and you see people rushing to the parks and everybody is trying to get back together as quickly as possible. So I, I really, I, I see it as a short term issue rather than a long-term one. And the longer term issue is that our urban cores need to be more dense. Mm -hmm. We, we need to be more dense. The suburbs exist, you know, that ship has sailed. We're going to continue to have suburbs. People are still going to want to live further out. It's personal preference. Um, But we need to allow for density. We need to plan for it. Um, We don't plan for it. And I'm sure, you know, Commissioner Ellis will probably talk a little bit about the fact that he can't zone and, and what are the challenges for zoning? Um, we, we have to think about it. We can't let developers and permit applications drive our urban planning. Yeah. I was, I think that, Stephen, I was just going to add that, you know, right. yeah, Matt. I was just going to add that, you know, also part of the issue, not just the changing use of a eight to five you know, lifestyle. What about a changing tempo? I mean, people are starting to talk about this hybrid approach where maybe they work different hours, varied hours. Right. People are going to be using their space at a different uh, at a different rate. I will tell you from the innovation perspective and looking at cities, one, I know, know we're gonna come back at, later on and talk more about the economy, but one issue that's up significantly is one specific type of travel that I work on, which is short-term rentals and vacation rentals. Mm-hmm. In the United okay. States, depending on the market, it's up 50 to 200%. So just imagine this, if people aren't gonna go back to hotels because of the common areas and the common spaces, the common dining facilities and so on, if they're not going to go back to hotels as quickly, but they're showing a great interest in business travel using urban multifamily short-term rentals type, you know, professionally managed properties, what are, what are we going to do in these cities where, you know, maybe that's not allowed, or we've traditionally, uh, 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 you know, maybe shied away from allowing that type of activity by based different uh, land use codes. If that's how business travelers are going to travel, we have to accommodate them. Mm-hmm. So it's different tempos based on the industry and based on that preference you were uh, talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the impact and the discussion around short-term rentals and what that looks like in economies is something we know is um, many cities are grappling with. And I think that debate only intensifies going forward, frankly, right, uh, in terms of the way that looks. You know, I think the other thing when we talk about the future of work and the future of development um, much of our advice to cities and mayors has been around helping them think about downtowns as experiences now, right? So maybe where you and I would have all gathered Monday through Friday, five days a week to work, maybe the, the office experience becomes more of a curated experience where you're spending less time there to do the collaboration, to do the innovation, and some of the more r- routine work is happening on other places. And so I think that is absolutely something that has implications on the way that we think about land use, the way we think about our short-term rentals, perhaps, and even transportation. And so Sharmila, that's where I want to go with uh, you. You're, you're our transportation, uh, one of our transportation gurus here in the city. um, And given the work that you do at Capital Metro, um, I saw you shaking your head when you said nobody's got uh, folks, we were saying that less people are using transit. You kind of shaked your head. There was a New York Times article recently. I think I, I pointed to you all as we were prepping for this, saying that 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 transit levels are down. The question are, will they come back? 
Um, people are, are not necessarily scared about going to the office. They're actually scared about public transportation, actually. I think if you talk to mayors and transit authorities, that's one of the things that jumps out. What impact do you see around transit that stick going forward? And let's start there and then we'll talk about big investments. So Stephen, since you mentioned New York City, I'm gonna start with the, in another New York City example, just Perfect. to kind of offer a counterpoint. I love so it. New York City also just um, did this revolutionary, uh, it's been going on for over, over a decade, the conversation was happening about congestion pricing coming into urban core. And now uh, under the current administration, it's gonna have expedited environmental review to have that pilot be implemented. It's gonna offer, and just to think, of, think about it in a different perspective, how we monetize congestion, and that $1 billion in tolling revenue is gonna help uh, supplement $15 billion transit debt financing New York City is planned to um, uh, undergo. So I, I think we need to take a pause and kind of talk in terms of Commissioner Ellis mentioned equity. It's become a buzzword. But it, what, what does that really mean in, in terms of public transportation? I want to start with a Cap Metro example. Starting small here locally. Um, so we had, right before COVID, we saw double-digit growth in our commuter routes and our Metro Express routes, overcrowding on rail. And then we also saw 18% um, growth in last year in ridership up until March. And then there was a 2.4 million system wide ridership that went down to about 1.3. We are still serving 1.3 million riders on a regular basis. And the other part that I wanna talk about is setting aside the larger climate change equation and how different cities and municipalities are gonna make that their own personalized agenda and how that's gonna get framed regionally and locally. I wanna talk about how, what we did to support um, our essential trips, our essential riders. Yeah. Five of our routes are carrying about 60% of our passengers in the midst of COVID. These are folks that don't have the latitude to work from home. Mm -hmm. So we put our resources, our operational resources to where our greatest need exists. I think that's equity, that's equity mm -hmm. in action. Yeah. And we're gonna to continue to see that. The other example, and that maybe sort of cross, uh, across between intersection between innovation that Matt uh, pointed out. Um, our Metro Access, our demand response, uh, provided 860,000 meals delivered mm -hmm. to most vulnerable of our populations in uh, Austin and Central Texas. That to me, it, trip's not taken, so we are, providing, we're transitioning from public transit provider to mobility solutions provider. And then for another segment of our ridership, we did Metro Bikes, uh, which is as, for, as a first and last month. To me, offering options, thinking out of the box, and just thinking, kind of matching our resources to where needs exist, that's where we're going to see public transit succeed. So Shamil, as I'm listening to your comments, it seems to me that maybe one of the things that the pandemic has forced an agency like yours where we tend to think, sometimes think about our transit agencies as maybe slow moving, large uh, behemoth organizations that are kind of rarely slow to, to, to transition. What, what I'm hearing from you is that, this is that the pandemic has really forced organizations like Capital Metro to be somewhat innovative in the way that it's servicing its customers, being responsive to the issues that, at, 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 that, we're, that we're living through at the time. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. It's no longer business as usual. I mean, we are under uh, the leadership. Our leadership is very dynamic. Our president and CEO has great vision, very equity focused. And I think as an agency, we rose up to the challenges. And I think we are starting to see the results of that. We are focusing on equity now and we are focusing on transformational investment, a generational investment with Prop Day. Mm -hmm. And I think community is listening and responding to it. So I think it goes mm -hmm. hand in hand, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. So for many of, last question uh, about, about Capital Metro, particularly here in Austin, and then we'll, we'll, we'll open it up for others, is that I know that many of my students that are coming to the LBJ uh, school across the country are very excited to come here because of the investment the city's making in Project Connect. They wanna study transportation policy. They wanna think about a changing urban environment. I mean, we're kind of an interesting microcosm for that here um, in, in Central Texas. 
as we think about Project Connect, how has um, that project maybe been reshaped by the pandemic or has it been reshaped? Are there, are there things about um, future planning for that large scale investment that may be different because of some of the trends that we're seeing with the pandemic perhaps? So I would answer that a little bit differently. I think uh, COVID is going to be measured in months, but Prop A and Project Connect and the progress and the transformational investment that it is, the impact of that would be felt by generation. So I, COVID impact is felt greatly in our operations and how we are addressing and being more agile and responding to the challenges, but it would not affect in this in same way, the project that's being built for generations to come. So mm-hmm. I would say there's not a direct translation, What we are doing is, I think, City of Austin and Cap Metro um, through Austin Transit Partnership have made a tremendous um, effort in placing uh, financial, putting money where uh, our mouth is. It's $300 million anti-displacement measure speak to that. And I think that probably came out and felt in a time where equity was on everyone else, like all of our minds. Yep. Um, but in terms of design decisions, I wouldn't think that that's, that's going to have an immediate effect. Mm-hmm. Okay. Commissioner Ellis, um, Harris County is an interesting place. It's, it's, it's one of the most dynamic, interesting places to study land use and transportation in the country for lots of different reasons. Um, love to get your thoughts on, on, on trends that you're seeing and how land use and transportation is kind of being shaped in, in Travis, uh, excuse me, in Harris County. Michelle pointed out that we are the largest unzoned city in the world. Uh, we also have the interesting dynamic of having more people in unincorporated That's exactly right. Harris County than you have in the city of Houston. So the largest city in Texas now is something called unincorporated. Harris County, which is akin to the wild, wild west because the legislature does not give counties ordinance making power. We have to get permission to do it. So we do have to think regionally. You know, I think in Texas, our system of putting together metropolitan planning organizations and COGS is a bit outdated. Uh, It was drafted in 1965. The the maps for our COGS were pretty much drawn when John Connolly was governor. So yeah, I was talking to Kirk Watson the other night, who, you know, former Senator and Mayor of Austin is here in Houston now. He was happy to be the other day. And he was talking about his experience when he was in Austin. So you, you go and have these meetings. In our case in Harris County, you know, I guess I have 1.2 million people I represent in my precinct, 5 million in the county. And you set up this regional board and we have two representatives from the county, two from the city, county 5 million, city 2.3 million people. And I'm voting with my friends uh, who represent Pearland. I don't know, 10, 20,000 people. How in good conscience do they take into account the population that we in the city of Houston have to bring in dollars for the region? But when it's time to vote, where you put them? Oh, we just had a big fight. Uh, We're fighting with TxDOT about uh, putting a freeway wider than the widest one in North America certain parts of it run through downtown, be wider than the Katy Freeway. That's the widest one. So it's a big challenge. And then you have the fights, the cultural wars going on in Austin, where you have the legislature essentially declaring war on urban entities, on our cities and our counties. And most of us now live in urban areas. We have to coexist. Uh, Houston has such a large footprint. We have to coexist with our suburban partners, even in within the city limits. Yeah. Uh, and you got to have some lens of equity. We don't want, I don't want to call the name of the normal city. You think about the, the motor city. I just won't call the name out, but you can't just go build, continue to build highways, toll roads, freeways. Totally agree. Let the core of the inner city fall apart. So, I mean, we're thinking about it. We, I, we just stopped the item or we were going to so, some county so- offices out to the suburbs. And instead, I'm advocating we buy one of these skyscrapers that may not make it and put those retrofit the building and put those offices downtown. Michelle, most of the architects and contractors want to do a new building like that one you in. You got me. Right. But I don't I don't want a lot of those that have been built to go belly up. 
So, so we think in and talk. Yeah. So for the panel, then just a broad question to open it up to, to any of you. So Commissioner Ellis raises a really interesting point. You know, Texas has has long, um, we're, nine in 10 of us live in urban areas, metro areas now. We, we at the LBJ School just released a report with the, the Kender Institute and our friends at the Bush Institute um, looking at an, an, an urban metropolitan agenda for the state of Texas. But it is, a, as someone who's been here now as a born again Texan back for two years, um, you know, born here, raised as a Texan, went away for 20 years and came back uh, and have joined at the LBJ School. An urban agenda and an urban message for a state like Texas is really very, and an urban agenda is still a large, it, it, is a, it is a heavy slog. How do we change the mindset in a state like Texas to, to, to recognize that we are not the wild, wild west anymore, that we need to make investments in our urban communities and our cities and our land transportation and our land use policies? What's needed to, to change the dynamic for that in a state like Texas? I mean, I'll just jump in real quick and just mention that I think it's always been funny that state legislators or our federal delegation, when they come back, will talk about how much they love Austin or they love Dallas or they love Houston, but then they want to create regulations or, or support uh, uh, political agendas that are not friendly to these cities. They'll talk about how vibrant our economies are and how important they are, but they don't want to support it. It doesn't make sense. So. In my mind, I come back time and time again thinking if we can tell the economic impact story, if we can show how much the, these cities lend themselves to becoming drivers for our state economy, that that would change their minds. But beyond that, uh, it starts to become uh, an issue, I think, where we dive into uh, political ideologies that we have to change as well. Yeah. Other thoughts or perspectives on this? I think we have to get the business community yeah. to step up. This is a place that's driven by business. Even for people who are afraid to even say climate change, we can still remain the energy capital of the world, but focus more on clean energy. I mean, that was a conscious decision to take a route we took instead of electric vehicles 100 years ago. Uh, so I think it's thinking innovative. Uh, obviously, at the end of the day, there are consequences to elections. And what we have now is this polar divide where if I just follow what the ultra left uh, of my side of the political equation wanted me to do, it'd be very unproductive. And I, I hope I've not done that. But many of my friends on the other side are just held captive, captive, reasonable people, captive by a small, thin sliver living in yesterday. Yep. Uh, and the federal government plays some role. I yep. think in uh, the new Biden package or transportation package, there's some clear things that will offer tremendous incentives for cleaner energy, and the focus on climate change and climate justice issues. And I hope we don't take the ostrich in the uh, ground, head in the sand approach that we took on uh, affordable health care expansion. I mean, it still baffles me to think of yeah. all my years in Austin, how you could turn down that much money. You know, there are only six states in America, by the way, that are predominantly minority. We went up. Yeah. We were back sure. and forth. You got me? I mean, it's just reality. You know, so just getting people to focus on science and not so much. Yeah, I mean, your point about climate justice, right? I mean, being the energy capital of the world, I think one of the things that that I've written about with with Senator, uh, former Senator Watson and others is that we are the energy capital of the world. Why are we not embracing uh, the future of clean tech as a way to grow our economy? That is a, a smart business solution. And it also makes great sense for ensuring our residents can participate in this economy. We can lead as well as address some of our, our, our climate issues. I mean, I think to, to two of your points, um, and then and we'll go on to the conversation. Um, you know, one of the things that I that um, that is interesting is that just as um, as you mentioned, there is a a, a conservative uh, dialogue that maybe shortens our our um, our seats. I also have a lot of times thought that maybe even the progressives are killing our cities too. That we forget sometimes about the middle and what we can do when we bring the public and private together around. Civ civic innovation. And for a state like Texas, that really, in a sense, builds itself as being pro-business, a free market, why are we not engaging on local solutions with our business community, to your point, Commissioner, to really ensure that we are thinking about how we can create a, a shared agenda going forward, which really allows us to start to to do exactly what, what I think all of you have suggested before is move beyond the word equity, but then actually say, well, how do you start to in, in, in deploy that 
in transportation planning, in land use planning, and as well as in our economic development initiatives. And so with that, our last sort of bit of our conversation before we move to, to audience questions is, is around this question of, uh, of a building a more equitable and resilient Texas. Um, a lot of us are remote working. We know that that's put strains on um, a lot of women, for instance. Um, a lot of our, fel- our women co- uh, colleagues are um, exiting the workforce to take care of children and, and bearing the, 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 the forefront of that. Great research from my colleague, Vicki uh, DeSoto and her colleagues that have done a lot of that, we're looking at that. We've seen the health disparities of COVID on um, bl- our black and brown neighbors. We've seen um, the impact of the recent winter storm in terms of in terms of what we've seen, at the challenges that's put on our infrastructure. Um, how do we move forward around an economic development agenda that starts to, to really address these issues? If you were, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Ellis saying these are two or three things that we should be doing as key priorities from an economic development perspective to build a more inclusive, resilient economy in Texas. What would those be? I think we ought to embrace our diversity. You know, California passed legislation that mandates that we diversify corporate boards. By the way, it'll be challenged in court. Uh, NASDAQ is looking at delisting of publicly traded companies if they don't integrate those boards, put more women, uh, put more people of color on them. I think Cap Metro, or, you know, our, our, our transit authority is doing a disparity study so they can have a program to grow our women-owned and minority-owned businesses. Hey, this is a diverse place and it's not going to change. So to my friends, I, well, look, when I went to the Senate, Henry says, now she used to give their little speech about uh, we're coming where they're here. You got me. Get over it. You got me. Uh, it's got just you. not going to change. And no matter how many rules you put in place, you delay the inevitable. You got to focus on training that next generation so they are in, as interested in entrepreneurialism as I am. Hey, I'm a I'm a liberal Democrat. I registered for NAFTA, and Richard recommended the government of Mexico hire me to help line up votes in Congress. Uh, this is when it was it was not as controversial as it is now. Met you too young. I registered as a foreign agent. I had to point out to people, not a secret agent. I'm a foreign <laughs> agent. I was representing the government of Mexico for our largest trading partner. Papers gave me hell. I used to tell them if I'd been representing England, they would have asked for a photograph of the queen. But I'm representing the brown people across the board who happen to be our largest trading partner. So I'm saying one can be a progressive Democrat, but also focus on business issues, but we got to ensure it, integrate the money. Mm-hmm. You have no, more cultural wars if it's the same people running it who always ran it. So Matt, I would let's always get, say, let's you know, your what, thoughts on local innovation. I want to go to Michelle and Sharmella as well on this question, because I think it's an important question to hit all, all of you to get your perspective. What's your thought, Matt? I mean, just local innovation. I mean, I think part, part of it, and, and the commissioner was just speaking to it, as I, I've always said that our side of the dial was always the party of job creation. I mean, some of the greats of, uh, uh, of the Democratic Party, you know, were great job creators, but somehow or another, there's been elements of this side of the dial that have seemed to shy away from creating a stronger economy. While at the same time, there's this political disparity on either side or this tribalism on either side, not wanting to work together. So my thought for being innovative, we have to start working together. We have to talk about the health of a community which means better access to more affordable housing, better access to greater transit options, more robust transit solutions, and at the same time, growing our economy, and it all works together. Mm -hmm. Michelle, what's your thoughts? I I have a couple of words that keep coming to mind, and the first one is intentional. You have to do it on purpose. And the second one is required. And, you know, I, I see the, the Justice 40 initiative as setting the expectation for requirements and attaching those requirements to funding, right? So if you attach it to the money, then things tend to change. To your point, Commissioner Ellis, if you make it required, integrate those boards, you know, make things happen, require that they happen until it becomes a natural occurrence. Um, you know, I think the, the Justice 40 expectations are going to be, uh, you know, and a, a serious impact. We're seeing it already. DOT is asking for infogrants to include equity and requiring that uh, they show benefits for underserved communities in their, mm-hmm. in their grant applications. So if, if the money is going to be tied to that outcome and the benefits are going to suddenly um, 
I don't know, take, take a higher priority because it's required. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we want to get to the point where requirements aren't required, right? You want to get there because it's the right thing to do. Um, But in the, in the beginning, I think attach it to the money and, Mm -hmm. and it helps project connect is going to, I think, benefit from the anti-displacement strategies that, that Austin is putting into place. I think that's Mm going to be a huge opportunity to show benefits to communities. Mm-hmm. I think that carrot and stick approach makes a lot of sense. Stephen, when, when I was at the LBJ school, I guess my kind of quasi thesis project was looking at the transition from LBJ's categorical funding. Well, you put strings on it because you were trying to reduce poverty to cities and counties and states want to block grant approach, but there's a tendency to go and take the federal money and do things that they would have done with their own money. Perfect mm-hmm. example, I'll be quiet. When I was on city council, had a brilliant Harvard-educated Afro-Panamanian guy want to get a new dog pound. He wanted to pay for it with CDBG money. And he had all these charts to show a disproportionate percentage of the stray dogs were coming from low-income Black and Latino neighborhoods. And coming from the LBJ school, having been on pro- probation, I remember thinking what LBJ would say. Well, doctor, if it's a stray dog, how in the hell do you know where it came from by definition? That killed it. Well, why would anybody in their right mind want to pay for a dog pound with poor people's money. So the feds, I think, even the state and cities, you got to, people don't just do the right thing because they want to do it. Yep. You got to have measures and you got to have some way to enforce it or we'll still be singing, we have a dream or we shall overcome 30 years from now. Yeah. Sharmila, any comments on this, on this from a transportation or land use perspective? Um, I mean, in terms of, I mean, because I mean, land use, right, and transportation are at the nexus of the way that we we can really address equity issues. Thoughts, thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Transit and land use, especially when we are poised to bring in high capacity uh, transit um, in Austin, I think we cannot um, focus or underscore more the need to have diversity of housing in the city of Austin. And um, to, to accommodate, when we talk about women leaving workforce, when we talk, talk about commute issues, how long it's going to take us to come to urban core, I think we really need to understand that and build, build in choice in our ur- urban um, housing as well. So it needs to really have flexibility to have more density in our ur- urban core have the missing middle that it's been talked about and it's time to introduce that. And at the same time, suburbs will be there. People will have that choice to be able to live out there. It's a personal choice. And I think we need to introduce and have that idea that rural and um, uh, urban living are not at odds with one another. I mean, rural, suburban, urban living, they could coexist and with choices, but we need to make the right choices for the right context. Yeah. Um, And I think that's a very important focus. And on the regulatory framework, I would just say that we would see um, equity and resiliency truly rise above the rest. Mm -hmm. I think COVID gave us a pause. It's time to rethink some of the things we were doing wrong for a while. It just highlighted Mm -hmm. them. It always existed. Yeah. It just highlight it highlighted the deficiencies, and I think it's our we can take that chance and to just do a better job building. That's right. That. I mean, I think one of the things to take about uh, the, one of the key takeaways I hope the audience takes away from this panel is that the reality is COVID didn't necessarily create new trends. It accelerated and highlighted a lot of the things that we were already seeing happening in our communities, and it shined um, hopefully a light on some of the inequities that we have that would op- keep creating an opportunity for us to start to maybe address those. Um, I do want to now start to take some questions from the audience. Um, and I know if you've got questions, I'd encourage you to include them in the Q&A function. Um, and um, I'll, I'll turn this first question maybe um, over to both uh, Sharmila, you and Michelle, um, because it relates, I think, to, to this question around density. Um, it, it is from Ryan. And Ryan asked us to think about and add, maybe talk about the need to create zoning beyond single families. I, you know. Um, duplexes, triplexes, you know, all those types of things. What types of innovation is needed um, around the way we think about uh, residential land use in our communities to maybe help start to address some of these challenges? Charmella? (laughs) 
Oh, Michelle punted. <laughs> I'm curious. Shoot, I've talked about this, so I'm curious. This is a this is a tough question, right? I mean, it's a yeah. question that a lot of our cities are grappling with for sure, and um, it is not, it is one that you know a lot of our communities continue to punt the ball down, you know, kick the can down the uh, to the street a bit. But it is it is front and center for it's lots of our communities now. It's definitely oh. an issue in Austin right now. Active issue in Austin right now. So, you know, even even odd mid sized cities are talking about the this this just incredible, just explosion of the cost of housing in their towns. But, you know, to use Austin as an example, I can show you plenty of two ones that might be available for today for about $950,000. We've got to be building different sizes of homes. We've got to be building a variety of homes and a variety of mix of housing while we're expanding this transit system. We've just got to do it. Sorry, Sherman. Well, and it, no, in no, proximity to downtown, yeah. Absolutely. I think Matt did the perfect prologue for this. And all I would say just kind of extending my thought on diversity of housing. Uh, it really needs to come with, we need to have realistic expectations of what it's like to live downtown versus eventual midtown in Soco and further out. I think we need to have realistic expectations of what the true parking needs are in 2021, as opposed to what's been in the past and how we have raised, we have been raised. So I, I would just say that it needs to be a choice made by the community. I mean, carrots and sticks are good, but this is Austin's opportunity to decide what it wants to be when it's fully grown up. And I think there needs to be a lot of community conversations out, kind of outlining the impacts of having seven floors of parking in downtown um, and then build uh, the stories above and talk about affordable housing in the same breath some of those floors could actually be affordable housing. Affordable housing, right. So and this I may be where, this may be where actually, do the right thing. And this may be a topic where our, um, our progressive NIMBYs, and I say that, um, cause I, um, I, I recently led a panel a couple of years ago, a uh, year ago at the Tribune, our progressives killing our cities, where even our progressive NIMBYs perhaps need to come to the table to realize that we actually need more density not just in um, in underserved or distressed neighborhoods, but also in our neighborhoods that are connected to amenities and access on transit corridors, in our areas that have got decent, good schools, those types of things. And so we have to think about density across cities, not just in particular zones, perhaps, right, maybe. The Obama right. administration did, did have an effort, uh, a rule in place to stop us from concentrating affordable housing in those segregated neighborhoods. So you give those people access to better quality life. In Texas, of course, that was back, that was repealed during the Trump era. Uh, I hope that the Biden administration will put it back in. And then in, in Texas, we have this rule where your state representative has to sign off to get tax credits mm -hmm. uh, to go in. It, it, it is, it's ridiculous. And by the way, although we don't have zoning, we still have rules here in Houston and Harris County. If somebody's on a metro line, why do you have a requirement for all those parking spaces? Well, that's nuts. Commissioner, <laughs> that gets to one of our second questions in the uh, in the in the Q and A, and that was thoughts on mandatory parking uh, requirements as as we look and build out more dense urban environments. Thoughts, or anybody have a quick snippet on parking? I would just say we have to think differently. There are these great innovations out there changing uh, commercial. Uh, access to commercial parking. So getting Amazon trucks and that sort of thing out of our dense urban course, out of the lane of traffic into a quick parking spot. There's a variety of other new technologies that are keeping us from driving around the block looking for parking. If we can stop that, then we can let buses go through much more quickly. But more than anything, we need to get out of the cars ourselves, which just means we need to be investing more in transit and those housing, um, uh, the, the different housing options, the mix of housing options that are needed along those transit routes. Change the rules. What about that old school technology, a bicycle? And we probably <laughs> lose weight. Yeah, that true. goes back to that health and wellness piece that Matt talked about at the very beginning. But I, I would also say that, you know, I, I think the the investment in a program like Project Connect will also lead to those behavioral changes that I think you were Im implying needed to, to happen, Matt. And that's, you know, not all of it is planning for today. It's planning for 10, 15, 20 years and how we're going to behave in that time frame, not necessarily to your point, Sharmila, how we were raised, but how we want to be. I would reduce the parking requirements. If we don't have as many places to park, 
maybe Shamila can get us on mass transit. <laughs> That's exactly. The, Thank the you, Sharmila. Mass transit. That is why mass transit is not going to go away. We need to connect communities better in a more affordable manner. And Project Connect, the lines that are going to be built, they also those are only three or four or five lines, major high capacity lines. But they got to be connected by best feeder bus system that you really don't look at schedule to get on them. So we need to make transportation choices more viable, more affordable. But then people need to live near them to take mm -hmm. full advantage of it. And make Shamila, I think it gets to one of the other questions that we have in the in the point. And I'll, maybe we'll just tack it on. And that is the sort of the distribution of the way we think about how we live and work, right? In terms of everything happening, all work happening in an urban core and all living happening outside. And so one of the things I think you're suggesting is a more integrated approach in the way that we live, work, and commute um, throughout our regions. And, and maybe that that for Texans. Is is a um, will require some some uh, a mind shift, but it's something that we that we I think may see as our cities become more in, more urban, more dense, and as we have to try to accommodate much of the uh, the population uh, uh, increases that are coming to our metropolitan areas, perhaps. I think also pandemic notwithstanding, we can't address climate change if we keep building out. I mean, I have to explain to people about impervious cover. All of the toll roads we built, I don't think a good lot planned for us to necessarily have 5 million people in Harris County. But if we were going to have 5 million, if we were doing it over again, we wouldn't have spread way out everywhere. And then you got to have all that impervious cover, which means when it rains, you can't get rid of the water. Mm -hmm. uh, and you got to pay for it. You got me? And we certainly are a very low tax mentality uh, community statewide as a people. So, so Matt, I want to follow up on your comment or question about um, short-term rentals um, that you made at the beginning of, of our discussion. And um, a question was posed in the Q&A session. Um, if we were to go down this route of increasing more short-term rentals in our, in our cities, in our communities to, to be more reflective of maybe business travel trends that we're seeing, what do you think are the implications for that as it relates to affordability? Can the two coexist in cities? And what, what's it, the balance there? No, certainly. You know, we did a study a few years ago in Austin and we uh, banned non-owner occupied short-term rentals because there were 400 of them um, and we were going to become immediately more affordable. Well, 400 is a small apartment complex. We did not become more affordable and the traveling uh, workers are not able to use those types of properties. Now, that's a much more nuanced and long conversation. What we are seeing with travelers that are using this activity in cities, since today's conversation about cities, is in more multifamily commercial mixed-use properties, highly professionalized, sometimes getting a hotel designation for those floors. Um, but it's typically 0.01% of the housing stock in any city. So we're talking about such a small number. What I fear is that if we're pointing our fingers at that as a, the boogeyman for why our cities are unaffordable, we're not solving the problem. We have a much bigger problem. We don't have a real affordability strategy to build needed workforce and affordable housing. Traveling workers and families are using that model for, for staying in cities, especially if they're staying for a longer period of time. Look, I mean, I'm a guy with a five-year-old. We can't put our child to bed in a hotel room and then go anywhere except for the bathroom to watch our iPads for three hours until it's time to, for us to go to bed. <laughs> you got to have an apartment with another room. So that, that's why a lot of new models have popped up. So it assuages the concerns of the neighbors and the NIMBYs that you had mentioned if these properties aren't in uh, the re single family uh, residential zones as much. Uh, but oftentimes you're finding them now in more commercial mixed use multifamily mm -hmm. zones. And I think that's the solution. But again, if we're pointing at that as the boogeyman, this tiny minority of, of housing inventory in our, in, our, in our cities, we're not solving the real problem, which is we need a lot more housing, a lot more housing. Mm -hmm. So last question for you all, we're almost at time. Um, and it's a, a, a smash of several of the questions uh, that are in the Q&A um, and a question that I wanted to pr propose to you all as well. Our friends from the Texas legislature are in, in session. They're in Austin, they're meeting. Um, we have talked a lot about trends that are impacting the way we live, work, and play in our communities. Um, what would be your one key priority issue that the Texas legislature could do for Texas cities? What would be the one thing that they could do for Texas cities as a, um, from a legislative standpoint this legislative session? 
I'll give you a second to think about it. I mean, I'll just pipe we'll in. Matt. Can, Matt, you're the eager beaver. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just wanted to, to have said, and I think Commissioner Ellis would agree with this. There has no, been no greater time for American cities and Texas cities than this time because of the administration that we have. We have great federal funds that are coming in, a huge infrastructure package that we're expecting. Uh, and then, of course, our COVID relief uh, package. We have so many mayors or former mayors who are uh, uh, secretaries of the, in the administration. It's a great time for local government leaders. So I would say for the legislature to work with local government leaders to create real strategies on issues that we're talking about today, like the economy, transportation, and housing. Okay, that's great. Uh, Michelle, your thoughts? Of course, you know, you, you outed me as a transportation person. So of course I'm gonna have a transportation priority, but um, right now, both the House and the Senate have um, compatible bills put forward by the transportation chairs to allow the state to bond against the mobility fund. And, um, you know, we, when we have gaps in funding from our traditional revenue sources, that is a backup. It's also more flexible. You can use it for more than just roads. Um, so I, I think that's an excellent priority for the legislature as well. Mm -hmm. Get out of the road building business and get into the transit building business, right? I mean, that is, that's a huge, huge issue for the state. I would um, say we need to be in both. We need to be in both. Fair we enough. Need to fair sustain enough. those roads and build transit. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, the the urbanist in me maybe leans a little bit the other way, perhaps. But fair <laughs> enough. Um, Sharmila, your thoughts on that question? So twofold. One of them is a little bit of an extension of what Michelle said. I really think this is this is time with four major urban. Um, four major cities in Texas in growing urbanizing population. The way I would say that this is really time to think transportation differently in Texas and have a true multimodal approach. We would need roads. We definitely would need transit to have them coexist better and plan in a more integrated way. When you build a highway, think about T ramps when you th uh, transit ramps to have better access to multimodal hubs. I think we need to think in terms of solving the broader solutions, look at the bigger problem and come together and not have such partisan debate about how we get there and who's on the right, who's on the left. Um, I think that that's one thing. The other thing I would talk about, Texas is um, kind of, economic success recipe may look very different from other states. We don't have to follow Californian model exactly. We can learn from it. Um, Anti-displacement measure is an outstanding and unique step in the right direction that many Californian cities were not able to do that at the right time. So I think public-private partnership to fit in, fill in the gaps where public funding has, has a deficit it's also another way and to encourage that, how we incentivize that, all of those will come together. So mm -hmm. I don't have one request, I have a pot of requests to consider. I got it, I love it. Um, and Commissioner, you have the last last word on this um, for us. I think these were all good suggestions and many of them um, micro as Shamila said. I, I back up and take the global view in terms of a macro issue because most of these others at some point will entail participation in our democracy. I, I, I think the greatest existential threat to the future of Texas would be those voter suppression bills that are passing through. Uh, it will change the whole tenor and tempo of most of what all of us do. And in, in my judgment, I, I'm encouraging our business leaders to speak up. It is akin to uh, what Martin Luther King Cesar Chavez and so many others uh, fought uh, to end. And you know now everybody's quoting, I have a dream and singing, we shall overcome, but they wouldn't have done it. Very few were there when King was around. I, I just think that the image of, uh, you just think of Bull Connor. Uh, I, I can't think of the, the most important thing they can do would be to kill those bills or get to the courthouse as quickly as possible. or hope that the United States uh, Senate uh, passes voting rights legislation over coming, or, or the cultural wars are going to be even worse because it, it's set up so only a small sliver of us will participate in our democracy. Yep. 
Uh, my friends, thank you uh, for a terrific conversation. I've enjoyed spending the last hour with you. It's been um, really uh, a privilege and uh, learning from each of you um, for the last uh, bit of time. I will now turn the program over to, um, to our friend, um, Eric, uh, for um, just some final thoughts, comments, wrap up. Thanks, Stephen. And thank you so much, esteemed panel, for sharing your time and insights with us this afternoon. Uh, for those watching us today, if you're not already a member of the Future Forum, I strongly encourage you to sign up on our website at lbjfutureforum.org. Uh, members enjoy first access to events and happy hours, networking opportunities, and benefits at the LBJ Presidential Library. Uh, thank you all again, and I hope to see you again soon.